We were made to be a person, people of presence. You know, if you were here last week, um, we encountered the presence of God in this place. I, my heart has been so stirred all week by what God is doing. Um, he's, he's running after a generation, Gen Z, and it's just so amazing. He put the gathering together. We didn't even plan for, uh, we had a young missionary, uh, Kirsten, who's with Circuit Riders, and she, she shared what God is doing how he's pursuing a youth generation. And then we heard from Katie and, and Brandon Campbell, who founded a 30A Praise uh, over in Florida, and just how God is showing up. We heard how God is showing up for young people in dreams, how kids who are growing up in atheist families are hiding Bibles in their house and getting friends together and, and reading the word together. I mean, there is a door. I, I don't know if you realize this, but cultural analysts, they are saying that all of the plausibility structures of our culture, the things that we've said, oh yeah, we've got a great, you know, America is great and, you know, our culture is great. It's like crumbling. The, the plausibility structures are crumbling. People are going, this, what is happening in our culture? What is happening is, is God is opening a window of there's a spiritual awakening. Young people are, they're opening their hearts to God. And, and I think God is just looking for people who will, who will hear and respond to the cry of a generation. And I, my heart has just been so moved when I heard that testimony that, that there's young people that are wanting to start prayer clubs in their schools. I'm telling you. It's just beginning. There is a, there's a wave of prayer happening a, across the world. It's not just here. It's around the world. God is, he's moving in our midst. So my prayer is just, God, awaken us. And I, I just want to pray really quickly a prayer of consecration over us, that God, would you just open our eyes to see the wonderful things in your word? God, would you open our hearts to receive it and to respond to what you're saying? And God, I pray today that you would just open my mouth and you would help me declare what, what you've revealed to me and what you've put in my heart. Holy Spirit, come. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the last time I spoke up here last month, we were in the Facing Giant series. And... I was sharing from a part of Israel's history when King Jehoshaphat was, was king at that time and he was surrounded by an enemy nation. But the whole message was on the persevering faith of a person who just fixed their gaze on God instead of looking at all the obstacles that were around him. And today, I'm picking up the story we're fast forwarding 150 years into their, into their history. And, and I want you to see what's happening at that time in history. So I wanna show you a map. This is, this whole thing was Israel right here. Because of sin, God split the kingdom in two. And so now they, they weren't like a united kingdom. They were a very divided kingdom. And the north, the northern part, the larger part, they had 20 generations of kings, zero out of 20 of them followed God. So these guys were getting obliterated. They were, they were being demolished. As a matter of fact, in 742 uh, before Christ, BC, they were uh, carried off into captivity by Assyria. And God was just, he was just fed up with the sin of the people, the, he kept trying to draw them back to himself and they refused to come. And he raised up a prophet at that time that was speaking to them. And this is, this is what the prophet Hosea said. He said, they set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. With their silver and gold, he's talking about the way they were using the money he had given them. They make idols for themselves to their own destruction. They sow to the wind and they're reaping a whirlwind. Israel has forgotten their maker. 
My people determ are determined to desert me. They call me the most high, but they don't truly honor me. And then you hear the longing of God's heart here. But you must return to the Lord and wait for your God always. I've been the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and no Savior exists besides me. Now, if we can put that map up again, the southern kingdom wasn't doing much better. They had a long run, like a 150-year run of kings that were marginally, they were trying to follow him, but they had compromise. They kept building up high places, like you can follow God or you don't want to do that. We've got some options for you. You can pick A, B, or C. So they had all this idol worship. They're trying to do both. I want to please God, but we also want to please the flesh. We want to, we want to make people happy. And it got them in a heap of trouble. They started following their northern brothers and going, you know, they're, they're worshiping idols. I guess we could try that too. And it didn't turn out well for them. Their men, their women, their children were also carried off into captivity. I just want you to catch, this is the landscape, okay? Like, it's a pretty desperate time. And as a matter of fact, where I'm picking up this story, the most evil king of all of them, his name was King Ahaz. He was in the southern kingdom. And it's at that time that he said, you know, I'm locking the doors to the temple. I don't even want God. We don't even need him. We're gonna, we're gonna just worship in the shrines. We've got all of our other gods. And this is, this is dark. Like, we don't have any room for God. And that's where the people of God were at. Now, here's the plot twist. And this is where I felt like, God, I feel like this is a parable for us today in this storyline, is that Ahaz has a son. And his name is Hezekiah. And though he had the most wicked father of all of them, what's so amazing in this story is that God brought a prophet, Isaiah, to Hezekiah. And he began to mentor the young mind of this man. And, and Hezekiah chose a different path. So I want to ask you, in this room, who is over the age of 12? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now, I want you to lower them if you are over the age of 27. Wait. If you're over the age of 27, put your hands down. If you're under... That's tricky, right? If you're... Let me say it another way. If you are under the age of 27, get your hands up really high. I, I really have to see you. Okay, this is awesome. Look around, you guys. Okay, thank you. Now you can put them down. We've all seen you. And you're just picked out in this room today because Hezekiah was, that's Gen Z. Between the ages of 12 and 27 represents Gen Z. Hezekiah was 25 years old. He was leading guys that were double his age he had such a heart of devotion to God. As a matter of fact, this is what scripture says about him. Hezekiah is 25 years old when he became king and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He knew that judgment had come to the entire country, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom because of sin because people had turned their back on God and not their face. And, and God brought the punishment that he said he would bring. And so he decided that th this was an opportunity. There was, this was a moment in time. I think we're in this cultural moment today that he was in. And he said, it's time to reawaken our hearts to the love of God. And the message today, what I entitled it, entitled it is, Awaken Us, Lord. Like, God, only you can awaken our hearts. It's not going to be an inspiring message. It's not going to come through talented worship. It's going to come from an encounter with the living God. So he decides to start at the root of the problem. What had his dad done? He had locked the doors to the temple. There would be no worship in that country. And this is what... 
Hezekiah did. This is where he started in the first year, the first month, he opened the doors of the Lord's temple. Here's what he was saying. God, I want you here. We say it a lot that God comes where he's wanted. And he was making, he was driving a stake in the ground. God, you know what? In my kingdom, as long as I'm ruling, we want you here. He brought in the priests and the Levites. He gathered them in the Eastern public square and he said to them, hear me, Levites, you consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of our ancestors. Remove everything impure from the holy place. How did impure things get into the holy place? It's amazing how easy when we're not tending to the fire, how impure things just seep in. For our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned him. They turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. They extinguished the lamps. They did not burn incense. They did not offer burnt offerings in the holy place of the Lord God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord was on Judah and Jerusalem, and he's made them an object of terror, horror, and mockery, as you see with your own eyes. <clears throat> our fathers fell by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity because of this. This was a desperate moment. It is in my heart now to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, don't be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to serve him, and to be his ministers and the burners of incense. I'm telling you, God is choosing. He's raising up a people. He's raising up young people. He's putting a fire in their heart. And he's saying, he's saying don't be negligent. Press in. Don't be afraid. He'll equip you for everything he calls you to do. When we step in and we say yes, God just begins to open up the doors. Where there was a wall in front of us, it just becomes an open doorway. So they repented of their own sin. And then for the next eight days, these Levites, they were just carrying the filth out of the, out of the temple. It took eight days. I don't even know what was in there. I don't even want to imagine it. But there was so much, and they were dumping it in the Kidron Valley. So it was a valley that was near Jerusalem. And then they began to put the articles in place that belonged there in the first place. And we're going to talk about these articles in just a, a minute because it's really where we're going to center. But then they began using the temple the way God had intended for it to be used. They were getting back to what God had, had said, how he wanted to dwell among his people, how we wanted, he wanted to be that eternal presence for them there. So then they began worshiping there, and they were just rejoicing. There was such joy. And, you know, the psalmist talks about this. In, in God's presence is fullness of joy. We look for it everywhere else, and it's in the rearview mirror because that's where the joy is. And so they were feeling such joy. Well, you know, when you start feeling the joy of the Lord, what starts happening? Man, you just want everyone to feel it. You want everyone to experience what God's, the goodness of the Lord. And so Hezekiah starts feeling this burden for the northern kingdom. He says, man, they are so lost and broken. So he sends couriers out, and he's got this invitation he writes up. And it's pretty gritty. I mean, he, it wasn't like this like warm, fuzzy message to make him feel good and come. He thought, you know what? God's going to move in the hearts of the people that he's going to move in. And this is what he says. Israelites, return to the Lord. So this is going out. You know, these guys are going on horseback, and they're going city to city. Return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he may return to those of you who remain, who've escaped the grasp of the kings of Assyria. Remember, they're all carried out. So there's a remnant that's, that for some reason they got left behind. Don't be like your ancestors and your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that he made them the object of horror as you see yourself, for yourselves. Don't become obstinate now like your ancestors did. 
give your allegiance to the Lord and become and come to a sanctuary that he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that he may turn his burning anger from you. For when you return to the Lord, it's going to have a ripple effect. Your brothers and your sons will receive mercy in the presence of their captors, and they will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful. He will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. And they were all in. No, this is what it says. So the couriers traveled from city to city, but the inhabitants laughed at them and they mocked them. It's pretty incredible to me, as I was just meditating on this, how we refuse to give God the life we despise. It's a life we don't even want, but I'm not giving it to God. And this is them. But in verse 11, listen to this, but some of them, a remnant of that remnant, humbled themselves and they came to Jerusalem. Also, the power of God was at work. It's God who causes us to will and do his good pleasure. The power of God was at work in Judah to unite them, to carry out the command of the king and his officials. And man, I'm just praying, God, would you just unite us to, to walk out the purposes of our king. Whatever it is you're wanting to do, God, unite us. Make us a united people of God. So what happens? The northern kingdom shows up. Now remember, there's been 20 generations of kings that these guys have no idea how to worship God. They've been worshiping idols. So they come. Church gets pretty messy, right? When people who have no idea, like some of you, maybe you're visiting and you're like, I don't even know what's happening in this place. You know, like you just feel that awkwardness. Like, it's like, I don't know what's, ha I don't know what's, what's going to be next. What now, what, what's that white thing in the front there? Like, we don't know. This is how the Northern Kingdom was. They're there, but they didn't, they didn't go through the process of, they were supposed to bring a burnt offering to give to the Lord, to say, thank you, God for letting us be here. They were supposed to do this ritual washing to show the washing of their sins. They didn't do any of that. So Hezekiah is watching all this. They're just partying with the people going, wow, this is really awesome, man. God seems really good. They're all excited. And Hezekiah is seeing this happening and he says, Hezekiah interceded for them saying, May the good Lord provide atonement on behalf of whoever sets his whole heart on seeking God, the God of his ancestors, even though he's not doing it according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. And the Lord heard Hezekiah, and he healed the people. The Israelites who were present in Jerusalem also observed the festival of unleavened bread for seven days with great joy. These people who didn't even know how to worship God right. This is a word to us. Sometimes we get all concerned about, oh, gosh, wow, church is getting really messy. People are coming in and they're hooping and hollering. We don't do that here. Like, they weren't worshiping the way that the people were accustomed to or, or were supposed to. But God's not looking at that. He's looking at our hearts. And he will always receive the heart that is seeking him and pressing, turning their face to him and not their backs this is a parable, and I, I know that to be true. I felt it, and I wrote it in my journal. I said, God, I feel like that's a parable for us today, and then I went to my Logos book app, and F.B. Meyer said, this is, a, this is a historical parable for the modern church. I was like, okay, God, confirmation. <laughs> hearing you, because I really believe that it is a parable, and why is this a parable? The doors of prayer were closed. In a lot of God's people today, the doors of our heart are closed. The fire had gone out. They were to burn candles day and night. They were never to be extinguished because it represented my presence is gonna be with you day and night when you're walking through darkness, when you're walking in the, I'm, I'm gonna be with you. It had gone out. That's happened in a lot of our lives. The, the hunger for the word of God, that was, there was a table of bread that it represented the, the bread of life. And for a lot of us, we've lost our hunger for the word of God. And here's the thing. This was a story 
about a, a historical temple. But you know what? The temple is not just this Old Testament pattern that was to be forgotten. It was kind of like God's flannel graph, his, his sermon illustration for the people of God. Because in the New Testament, he says, listen to what he says, do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He now calls us his temple. He now calls us to open the doors of our heart. He now calls us to remove the filth and to put the things that he yearns for, giving him his proper place. It's a calling to us. Do you not know your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. 2 Corinthians 6.16, it says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them. I'll walk among them. I'll be their God, and they will be my people. God's calling us that. He's calling us his temple. Ephesians 2.21, and in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, I want to give you a picture. It's just a drawing of the temple at that time. And, and I want you to see how, how everything, every article in this temple was to be an encounter with the living God. God says, everything that I want in you, it's, it's to help you encounter me. It's not about some religious duties that you're doing. It's I want you to encounter the living God. And so we come, the, every person would come, and I'm gonna try to fly through this pretty quickly, but they would come through this Eastern gate. Jesus, this is the first encounter with Jesus. He says, I am the gate. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. He calls himself the gate. They were to enter there. And then, and then back to the thing, you can just keep that up and I'll read you the scriptures. I'll tell you the references so that you can see them. We might not have time because I really want you to see this. Then they would come. The first stop would be the brazen altar where they would put their lambs on the altar. And Jesus said, I am the spotless lamb of God. I went to that. I sacrificed my life for you so that you can encounter me. He says, I want you to encounter me through the sacrifice that I made on the cross. And then they would, they would be cleansed right here at this, this labor. And that, it says, if anyone, if anyone confesses their sin, I'm faithful and just to cleanse you. It's the cleansing of the forgiveness of Jesus that was made possible on the cross. Then, now they were cleansed. They were clean so they could enter. They could enter into the holy place. And here was the lampstands. The lampstand was the presence, Jesus' presence. He says, I am the light of the world. Those who walk in darkness... If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light of light, John 8, 12. But the lamps had gone out for the people of God. And he's saying, reignite those lamps. Remind yourself, I'm the light, I will light up your darkness. And then they had this table, it was a table of showbread, or they called it the table of the presence of the Lord. That he said, I am your nourishment. You're not gonna get it from idols out there. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. I am the bread of life and I will sustain you. My word will sustain you all the days of your life. And then here was the altar of incense that the priest would offer. He would offer prayers for the people of God. And in Hebrews, it says, therefore Jesus is the high priest who lifts up prayers for us. He's able to save completely those who have come to God through him because he lives forever to intercede for us. Hebrews 7, 25, do you know right now, I don't care where you're at, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for you. He's praying for you. He's, you are on his mind. This is so powerful. He wants you to encounter him. And then 
Here was the veil. Now only the high priest could go in and he only came in once a year into the Holy of Holies. This was the most holy place. This was the presence of God. And Jesus is the veil. He's the veil. And the veil was torn when he, Jesus died on the cross. In the actual temple, it says the, the veil tore from top to bottom. In other words, Jesus was saying, enter into my presence now. There's nothing separating you from God. But this is what Hebrews says. It says, enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open to us through the curtain. That is his body. His body was torn so that we could come and have access to the Father through him. So let us draw near to the throne, the mercy seat of God, with confidence and with full assurance that faith brings. The high priest would come in with the blood of the sacrifices and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And Jesus said, it's my blood that is made away. It is my blood that has given you full entrance. So come with confidence into the throne room of grace. I wanted you to see that picture because these were the articles that had been thrown out. And every article was to point them to Jesus, the living God and his presence with them. So what does that have to do with us? What does this look like for us? I think because we are, if we know God, we are his temple. And maybe for some of us, the doors have been closed. It's just been a long time. It's like we're living life just fine. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Things are going, wow, up and to the right with our careers. And, you know, there's just a lot going on. And so we just really haven't had time to open the heart, the doors of our heart to the Lord. And he's saying, I want you to reopen the doors and let me in. And then he... He wants us to remove the hindrances from our life. Removing whatever is hindering. You know, all of us have an organizational principle of our life. Everything in our life revolves around it. For some of us, it could just be like, I don't, it's, you know it's an organization organizing principle, it takes a lot of thought space. Maybe it's your workouts. It's like, okay, so then I'm going to do this and this and this, and I've got it. Okay, I'm going to give five hours to this. I'm going to do, and all of a sudden, it's like, gosh, I just don't have as much room right now for God. It's just a really busy season. That's your organizing principle. Or he can become the organizing principle of our life. What had happened to the people of God was they thought they could have a lot of things organize their life around, a lot of loves, a lot of idols. And what idols a lot of times do, and maybe you have found this to be true, I have in my own life, is that uh, they start taking more and more space than I wanted to give them. It's like, ooh, wow. And they start... I can't really see God because all I can see is these things that are in my heart now. So we've got to remove the obstacles. What I loved in this, this whole story is that the children of Israel who had known nothing about God helped Judah go out to the Kidron Valley and they started breaking the, the altars and the shrines. They broke the Asherah, Asherah poles. It says they ground them to dust. What were they saying? We're not turning back to these things. We're not going back. Our hearts are fully devoted to God. You know, when we come into the presence of God, Jeremiah 23, 29, he says, is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You get into the presence of God, and sometimes I'm just like, God, I just need a hammer today. I know it. Man, my heart is getting so stinking crusty and hard, and I want to encounter you, and I just need your word to be the hammer that breaks and the rock that crushes. I want this out of my life. I want these thought patterns, the negative, the complaining, the pride, the fear of man, whatever it is in my own heart, God, I need you to crush those things. They're just like taking up space. We remove the hindrances. And then, God, we just begin making space for you. 
I want to approach you. You're the gate. So I'm going to come through the gate with thanksgiving and into the courts with praise. That's what gratitude starts filling our hearts again, right? Psalm 100, we begin to walk in gratitude again. God, I'm not just going around the sacrifice that you made for me. I recognize today. I preach the gospel to myself. I go to the mirror, and I've probably mentioned this to you before because I still do it. And I just start preaching the gospel to myself, you sinner. Like I need, I remind myself, Jesus, it was your sacrifice. This was for me and I need this today because I know my propensity to wander. And usually I don't take big strides away from God. It's just these little minuscule steps. And all of a sudden I find myself in thinking patterns that are not pleasing to God and that break my own heart. And so um, we come, we come, and then we, we have this opportunity, that labor that, where they were washed to confess. God, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just, you purify me. And I can come right into the presence and I just light the lamp of your mercy and your presence with me in the light, in the darkness, you're the light of the world and I acknowledge that and I open the bread of life. That, that table of showbread, the table of the presence of the Lord, I just presence of God speak right now. Holy Spirit speak. Every time, and young people, I want you to hear this. When you open God's word, he's gonna open his mouth and he's gonna speak to you through it. He's that good. He is that good in, in what he wants to do in our life. And then I approach him with my needs. He is the intercessor bringing, bringing my needs before the, the Lord. And so, Jesus, I bring you this. I just, this is what's burdening my heart. He wants to carry it. We acknowledge that. See, the articles, every article in that temple is an encounter with Jesus. And every day, can be an encounter with God. There was a quote I wanted to give you, and I don't know if I'll be able to find it. It was so good. I'm not seeing it anywhere, so. Okay. Well, I'll post it on social media one day. Okay. <laughs> give God his rightful place. You know, this is what legacy we have been feeling this And we know it's not like just a good idea. We know it's a God idea, birthed by his spirit, that we are not to make our life of, we want to swing wide open the doors of God for encounter. Because every awakening comes through a personal encounter with God. Every awakening. And so how, what does that look like for us as a, as a fellowship, as a body of believers here? We now have created, and you've, you've seen it, and maybe you've asked questions. What's with this calling people forward? Why are we doing this? It's a response time. We're, we're giving our hearts time to respond to the living God, that if he's speaking, I don't want to just go out the door and get my barbecue ready and get on the boat and forget what he said. I want to have time for it to settle below here and just... God, I want to respond to what you're saying to me right now. Let him show you. God, open my eyes to see. So we're doing that. We're, we're actually hosting prayer gatherings. If Maybe you didn't know this because there's like five or six that show up, but I want you to know all of us are invited to these prayer gatherings, 730 on Sunday mornings, a time of just God, whatever you want to do in my life, I'm yours. It's a time of consecration, 30 minutes before we get ready for the gatherings. But we, I'm telling you, he just never disappoints. We have midweek prayer. None of these times are sacred. Like, if times don't work for people, I'm like, just move them. The times aren't sacred. God's sacred. So we just want to gather in his presence. And there's something that happens when we gather together. Because if you're like me, I love my prayer time alone. I'm just going to confess it. I love just closing myself up in my room and just hearing the voice of God. But there's something that happens. It's happened every single time, 100% of the time. God's like a kaleidoscope, and he reveals something to you that he didn't reveal to me. He, re he speaks something through you that I wasn't even thinking about. 
we can be gazing at the same scripture and it's like this, literally the only word I can think of is a kaleidoscope. There's like, how are we getting so much from this one little section and through the collective prayer coming together of the people of God, we're encouraged, we're strengthened, we're fueled to do the things God's calling us to do. So we're doing that. And man, I invite you to join us Wednesday evening, 6.30, Wednesday mornings through July. Uh, we're meeting over on the property at 8 a.m. and bring a lawn chair because it's pretty thorny, but we're just calling down heaven. And it's been so sweet what God has been revealing. Coming up in August, and I want you to get ready because this QR code here, 24-7 prayer. We are joining our nation it is a year of unbroken prayer. And we, I signed up, you might have remember, I said a year ago, I just signed us up for a week of prayer. Well, here we go. It's coming up from August 26th to September 1st. And we're not gonna, we're not gonna let the fire go out day and night around the clock. And so that QR code on the seat in front of you, it will take you right to a place you can sign up for a specific hour all week. Part of what we're gonna do we're gonna read the word out loud. I don't care if you're alone, you're the only one in here. Reading it out loud, and then we're passing the baton to the next person and picking up. And we'll have a spot on the, the Google sheet to share, this is what God revealed to me during this time. This is what he's speaking. Can you imagine the collective power of God as we do this. So mark your calendars. Man, some of you, you have insomnia at night. Praise God for you. You get the midnight hours, the 1 a.m. hours, 2 a.m. You just go storm heaven. And I'll take the early times. Just kidding. So I want us right now, we're going to turn this place into a place of celebration. And we're going to baptize some individuals because here's what has happened. I want you to see this is a picture of what happened in Hezekiah's days. There's some people that they said, I'm not keeping the doors of my heart closed. I'm opening them wide to God. And God, you can have your way in my life. I approach you not by my own works, but by the work of Jesus on the cross. I can come right into your presence, God, and find mercy and grace for my life. And so we're gonna celebrate that they've made that step. So I want you to celebrate with me, AJ and Evan. You guys can come right on up here to the side and we're gonna baptize you. Come on, give it up for